open with a quote from Thomas Edison. He said, the doctor of the future will no longer treat the human frame with drugs, but rather will cure and present, prevent disease with nutrition. Are, are we there yet? <laughs> We're on route. <laughs> so tell us about what you do at the Center for Integrative Health and Center for Integrative Nutrition. So um, at the centers, uh, we, are, uh, we have a broad-based set of integrative approaches to healthcare. The one that I'm uh, particularly passionate about among all of these, well, I'm passionate about all of them, but particularly about nutrition and food as medicine. And we've been developing programs, clinical programs, research programs, educational programs, community outreach on all levels to try and really uh, help create what we think is the medicine of the future, which is actually the medicine of the ancient past. Yeah, Hippocrates uh, said it best, right? <laughs> and, uh, and Hippocrates probably learned it from ancient Chinese medicine and Ayurvedic medicine. So this has very, very deep roots. It's a perfect lead-in. Tell us about Ayurvedic medicine. I know you're a, you're a medical doctor, a Western medical certified doctor, but you also have a big focus on Ayurvedic medicine, and not necessarily everyone understands or knows what that means. So, yeah. so yeah, I, I did my medical training in the conventional Western medical model, and uh, then got out into practice. I'm board certified in family medicine, so I practiced for many years and realized I didn't really have all the tools that I needed to help people. And my parents are from India, and so I knew a little bit about Ayurveda. You know, I thought it was kind of home remedies and things like that. And uh, at somewhere when I decided to learn uh, a different way of helping people heal, I, it, you know, um, Ayurveda really resonated with me. It's, you know, a mind, body, spirit approach to medicine. So it's a thousands year old uh, health and healing system. So it's a very comprehensive healing system that incorporates many, many different modalities. But really the foundation in Ayurveda is that food is your medicine and digesting your food. And so, you know, there are lots of quotes and different sayings in Ayurveda about how important it is to eat properly and, and have good digestion. And that's the core of your health. And then everything else is complementary. But it's a really rich medical healing system that's really based on prevention as well as the root. And then there are lots of treatments for health conditions when they happen, but the really the principles are based on prevention and empowering people to be their own healers. That's the thing I think that interested me when you and I first chatted is that Western medicine often deals with the symptoms of the problem. You're treating the symptoms, whereas Ayurveda would say that's number six, and we go back and start at step one. And I think that's really fascinating, thinking about prevention, or perhaps if you're on a certain trajectory, it doesn't mean that you're predestined to end up there. You can take steps and, um, in your diet and your activity and, and eliminating toxins and so on to change that. And I think that's really fascinating. Now tell us a little bit about what you do at the Gerson Institute. Okay, at the Gerson Institute, uh, we're a local nonprofit and we have, um, we have another anniversary we're actually celebrating. We're 40 years old this year. And we, are, we were developed as an education and training and information and referral agency for the work to support people that would like to follow Dr. Gerson's work. He was, he was trained as an internist, he was a neurosurgeon, he was a soil scientist in his own right, and he even for a period of time served as the um, agricultural consultant to the Prussian government at that time and also the Bavarian government before he came to the United States in the 30s. And he originally developed the Gerson therapy to treat his own migraine headaches. And he did that through a diet elimination program. And then that progressed and developed to his using it to treat skin tuberculosis at that time. And then developed into uh, pulmonary tuberculosis. And soon after that, he was asked to also try it for, for cancer, which he refused at first because he said, I know nothing about that. And this is so, but he was, he was starting to realize that he had a systemic program here, he, he, he came from the attitude and the concept of totality. So he looked at everything. He looked at the air quality issues, the water issues. Besides the, the nutrition, it had to be fresh, organic. Uh, he developed, of course, individual protocols for people, but there were similarities. And some of the basics were just like salt restriction, potassium enhancement, uh, some natural supplementation, protein restriction initially, and um, 
developed, continued to develop the program to treat very seriously ill people. So that's where uh, now training doctors around the world in cyberspace and a teleeducation program and expanding our ability to help more people. So it's very exciting to see the, um, the interest coming from everywhere with, with not just that it's necessary to eat healthy, but that it can really be used as, as a treatment for very, very serious illnesses to bring the body back into total balance and to, to move to a vibrancy, a kind of vitality of life. It's been said that uh, food can either be the best medicine or the slowest poison, right. right? And so we have a little yin and yang on this panel today to talk about both sides of that coin because it's important, right? As we talk about what you should choose, maybe sometimes we have to talk about what you should not choose. And it, it may, and depending on the discipline or the focus, that, that answer may vary. But I want to use it as a segue to my friend Zen over here to talk about the work that you do, Zen. Oh, thank you so much. Well, I'm Zen Honeycutt from Moms Across America, and we're a national coalition of unstoppable moms. And our motto is Empowered Moms, Healthy Kids. And we raise awareness about GMOs and toxins, all kinds of toxins from all kinds of exposure. And we offer GMO-free and organic solutions. And through supporting local leadership, we are creating healthy communities together um, in collaboration with many different organizations. And that means offering free materials, supplies, training, talking points to go to city council or join into Fourth of July parades or to reach out to your food director at your school. And so I'm very excited to connect with people from all across the country and now around the world. We have mothers across the world as well. And, and to see the results that children are getting better. You know, our children are the most vulnerable to these toxins, and they are getting better by changes through diet. In fact, my, my three sons who are in the back are, are examples of that. Uh, they had allergy, life-threatening allergies. My son almost died from pecans and the stuffing on Thanksgiving, and also um, autism symptoms, asthma, and autoimmune issues, and all of them have recovered through um, using food in their, in their diet, eating organic, taking care of the gut biome, which I'm sure we'll talk about. And, um, and, and so I know that we can do this as a country. We can recover our children and our families, and we can turn around the food industry and, and the health in our country. Thank you. And now, John, you also have some background in GMO, but that's in, that's in generally your scientific expertise. But you also have a laboratory. Tell me a little bit about what it is that, that the laboratory does. What is it testing for, and how does it work, and, and why? How does it relate to what she's doing? Uh, very good. Um, what, what the Health Research Institute is designed to do is to create transparency in the food system so that everybody can make better choices about the food they eat. That has to do with the good things, the nutritional aspects, and also the bad things. The pesticides, the GMOs, the, uh, all of those sorts of things, the heavy metals that might be there. And so what we do is we, we carry out testing, which then is used by organizations such as Zen's and many others around the US to inform the public about these issues. And our belief, our, and we're very confident of this, is that when moms and dads have better knowledge about the quality of their food, they can and they will make better choices about what they feed to their families. And that is going to have a cascading effect all the way through the food system. It creates demand for better food. And ultimately, farmers were, are going to need to figure out ways. They're very creative and innovative and ingenious individuals. And they're going to figure out ways to produce food without these nasty chemicals that harm our physiology and produce food that is actually higher in nutritional value because that both of those can be really measured and connected with the practices of agriculture. So that's what we're working on. Healthy soil, healthy food, healthy people. So we're dealing both with the soil microbiome, the gut microbiome, and sort of all of the effects that can have positive and or negative in terms of overall health. Now, since we're in the dirt, we maybe we ought to go to the farmer on the panel. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about how you got into farming from your last career. So um, my name is Stephanie Norton. I'm the founding farmer of Dickinson Farm. Um, this is nothing that my husband and I ever expected to do. 
um, <laughs> know where we expect it to be. Um, if I follow my original life plan right now, I would be finishing up in Kuwait and heading back. So um, I went to a deployment uh, just prior in our pre-deployment pre workups. Um, I was on Saco Many Island and I got bit by a tick. Military medical system is amazing if you've been shot or have a broken leg, but anything else they really don't know how to deal with. So the medical system looked at me and said, well, you have a plane to catch and we have a deployment to go on. Um, so 10 months uh, in another country, I was at Guantanamo Bay dealing with the detention centers. There were days that I couldn't walk. If I stayed standing, I could stay standing, but anytime I laid down to go to sleep, I couldn't really move my body and it just kept on getting worse and worse. Um, I came home and the attitude then was now I could figure out what was going on. So I got bounced around to a whole bunch of doctors and then finally landed with a misdiagnosis which landed me with an amazing doctor. So I'm very thankful. I had a misdiagnosis of ankylosing spondylitis and the attitude was, it's okay because it'll stop hurting when your spine fuses together. Um, so we ended up with an amazing doctor here in San Diego um, who was considered the best for ankylosing spondylitis and was gonna give me somewhat of a life. That day I could walk slightly and I came in and he said, you don't have it. I know, pretty sure I know what you do have. We're just gonna take some blood and we'll talk in a month. And in that month, I got married. We went on our honeymoon. And uh, we'll get to it about a week after we get the diagnosis. And that day I was told, for the next two years, you're going to be in an IV chair. Um, and we're going to start today. And I said, no, 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 I'm on active duty military. I have to run up. I have to tell my unit, like, I can't do this. And the attitude was, you'll be here Monday or you'll be in a hospital. Um, I had um, my bacterial load was active. I typically in remission for Lyme, your bacterial load is about less than 200 and mine was 27,000. So I was a Petri dish. Um, undiagnosed in my tissues, my bone marrow. Um, and we started IV therapy. And his, his thing, he's an amazing doctor, but he said, you're gonna be mad, you're gonna go home and do whatever sailors do, you're gonna drink, you're gonna smoke, whatever you're gonna do. But I'm gonna tell you if, you, if you watch what you're doing and you don't inflame your body anything more than what Lyme is already doing, the medicine will work better, it'll work quicker, and you won't destroy yourself anymore because I'm gonna kill your immune system, I'm gonna kill everything in you to get rid of this bacteria. So if you do this, it'll help you. And he's like, but take a week, be angry, you know, I'll see you Monday. And we, we spent about three months dealing with, you know, other, we did CSAs, we tried a personal chef, we tried all these things, and as a military family, we were like, we're gonna go broke, there's no way. Um, my husband was on duty at nights and taking me to treatment during the day, and, and out of desperation, I was finally like, I said to my doctor, if I go vegetarian and just grow my own food, it, can I do that? Like, will you tell me, I don't know how to be a vegetarian, like, can you tell me what I have to eat to get through this? And his answer was, you think you want to spend your time not here growing your own food? And I was like, yeah, like that's, that's personal, completely rational. He was like, don't let her kill herself, do whatever you're gonna do. <laughs> and um, my husband and my cousins and my dad built me some raised beds that I could sit on the edge of. And in the evenings and weekends, I grew my own food with no experience. I'm from Orange County, my husband's LA. Um, and we, it, it turned out very well. You started a new program this year. We did. Tell, tell us about pharmacy. I love this. So with this, we've been, we've been, uh, we, we started farming in 14. We went to market in 16. Um, and then last year we were, I was talking with my, my nurse and just, you know, how are you? How's the community? That type of thing. And when we were talking, I was like, yeah, we're selling to our community, our neighbors. And she reminded me in the, the way that best nurses do that your community is the people that sit sat next to you for two years in an IV chair, right? Your community is the people that, that had the same struggles. And don't forget that those people still sit there every day and new people still fill their chairs. And they're who need your food. And we grow 100% heirloom. We, we don't take anything that's past World War II. We, we only use very, very little organic pesticides, and that's when it's just the load is too high and we're gonna lose the whole farm. And in four years, the only thing that we've sprayed is organic copper. And we're really considerate of that for my health and, and our customers' health. So after thinking about it, and I reached out to Christina, we had worked together before, and she does amazing work with 
heirloom grains and heirloom vegetables and they do cook differently and she can work with them. And I was like, hey, I wanna do this thing. Like I, I wanna get our food in front of patients and everything from the, I just got my diagnosis and I can't even stand up to cook for myself to the, hey, I'm doing well and I wanna get back to cooking for my family and everything in between. So we launched it and it's been, it's been amazing. Thank you. Let me ask you something, Gordon. It's been my understanding for a long time that uh, nutrition wasn't sort of part of the required curriculum for medical doctors. Is that still the case? It's changing, although gradually. Uh, so seems a little counterintuitive. I, I'm just a layperson, but <laughs> I mean, we got we got we got training in biochemical nutrition. You know, we all had to learn how to recite the Krebs cycle forwards and backwards. You know, 16 times, but that has no clinical practical application. It's found its way a little bit. Uh, they're teaching maybe a little more about the epidemiology, the nutritional epidemiology of heart disease, diabetes, some of the chronic diseases. But so how food relates to those specific conditions. Yes. And, uh, Don't eat this, eat that. And in some quarters, it's just lip service. In others, there is an effort to try and ingrain it into what people do in practice. How does that differ from what you do? Uh, we are fully focused on using food uh, either as an adjunct or as the sole therapy for any patient, for any health condition that comes in the door. You have something that I've seen, a pyramid of what's called or what you call the therapeutic order. Sort of, if most of us who've been to the doctor had a condition, we know that typically we're, we're told to take this medicine and or potentially have this invasive procedure. That's not where you start. Where do you start? So. Years ago, when my dad was sick, when he had developed cancer <clears throat> and trying to find a way to help him, and his doctors at Johns Hopkins told my family that he would likely die in less than a year, I realized Western medicine didn't have the answer. And I just started searching, reading on the old microfilm machines and the bowels of Johns Hopkins Medical Library, and I came <laughs> they across- They still have those, they do, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> I'm dating myself here. Me too, uh, it's okay. <laughs> and, and I, my eyes bugged out when I read the story of a physician who had healed himself of advanced prostate cancer through a major change in his diet. And, and he was as skeptical as anybody, but he had this experience. And I found out about him, met him, and met a community of folks who were doing similar things. Part of me thought that, you know, this is some kind of a strange cult that I'm slipping into. You know, people who claim to be able to use food to treat all these diseases, and yet, when I started to change my own diet to have uh, support for my dad, I realized, wow, I'm feeling better than ever in my life. And I then learned that all of the uh, chronic health conditions that we're facing, the epidemic diseases as well as the chronic ones like heart disease, diabetes, and cancer, all have strong nutritional links, strong dietary factors. It seems that food is is somehow involved with the top two to three, you know, killers that we know of, diseases. Is that, how's that differ, or is that similar to your work? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, again, it starts with the digestion and the food, and, and um, what about digestion? Because that's a specific focus in Ayurveda. Tell us about that. Yeah, it's very interesting because, you know, although food is, you know, the most important factor. And in fact, I think I had sent you that quote, um, there's an ancient proverb, and this is thousands of years old, you know, that um, when, when f the diet is wrong, then medicine is of no use. And when, when diet is correct, then medicine is of no need. So there is this philosophy that, you know, you have to eat properly. However, and we see this quite a bit, there are a lot of people who are eating what's considered the right foods. And, and in Ayurveda, we all have different mind body types. So I think that's where people struggle a bit. And where no Ayurveda one size fits all. Exactly. Yeah. And you really have to look at everyone as an individual. The food, you know, should be a organic and non-GMO and, and, you know, from nature and all of those things. And then how you prepare it is very important as to how you're going to digest it. Whether it's it. raw or cooked? Raw or cooked. And also there's this principle of the six tastes in Ayurveda where, you know, in Western medicine, it's very reductionist. We look at this one food and we say, oh, that's carbohydrate. That's bad. But if you eat it with uh, the micronutrients that you need and spices, and they don't have to be like hot spices, but just savory spices, that's what helps you digest that food. So there's this concept of, 
of how you're going to digest the food. Are you optimizing your digestion? And a lot of the foods are all about, now we know with science, which has been really fun to do the science, that a lot of you know these healthy foods are shifting the microbiome, and they do most of the digesting for us. But in Ayurveda, again, it's the six tastes. So we focus on macronutrients, which is what we learned in medical school, carbohydrates, fats, proteins, how much do you need of that? Those are the energy foods, and they're important, but that's one taste in Ayurveda. And the other five are all about the micronutrients and what you're putting in your food to support your own digestive process so that you don't have to take other things to help you digest your food. You're optimizing your internal mechanisms for healing. And so when you combine a little bit of sour and a little bit of salt and the pungent and then the bitter and astringent, those are all the micronutrients, then your body will this heal This is also improved digestion. It helps you to improve the digestion so that you can extract the nutrients from the food. And also there's this concept of synergy even in food science now where when you, you know, one plus one doesn't just equal two, one plus one can equal 10 if you're combining foods in the right way. There's this concept of food synergy. So I think that's what these, you know, and a lot of other traditional healing systems recognize when you know, a lot of ethnic cooking naturally has a lot of these flavors all mixed together. And that's what my mom did. She just knew what to put in the foods. She didn't necessarily know it as a scientist, but she was a food scientist, right, in the kitchen. And so any food you made, you knew what to put in it. And then in my analytical mind, now I look at all these recipes and I'm like, oh yeah, it's got all There's the six a reason for it. it. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's interesting too that each of those tastes has a very specific purpose of what it's doing in your body to help you digest. Because again, otherwise you can eat healthy food and still not digest it, absorb it, use the micronutrients the way they're you know, meant to be used. And so it's very, it's very um, it can be very complicated. It's a very sophisticated sort of science, but honestly, it's the easiest way I ever found to figure out how to eat. And so, um, and it's fun, you know, when you, you know, you know, my kid, I taught my kids, you know, the, these are all the six tastes. And then we would look at our food and say, did we miss one of the tastes? And sometimes you just have to add one little thing and it makes it a complete meal. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that's again, optimizing your internal healing because Ayurveda is all about um, using what your body already knows what to do, but things have just gotten in the way of it. Maybe you're not giving your body what it needs to do the healing process. And, um, and again, food is, is key in that process, but also optimizing the internal mechanisms that we have for healing. So we, Gordon and I talked a minute before the show, I brought a couple of kale salads and I forgot that he had told me that it would be best to cook some of the kale. I could have one raw kale salad and one partially cooked kale salad because a lot of people can't digest raw kale. I mean, I'm a big kale fan. I know no one likes to admit that, but, um, <laughs> but then you had a very specific answer as to why it is. And so I was thinking about as you were talking that people think I can't eat that good ingredient, but it might be they can't eat it raw or they can't eat it cooked. Tell us a little bit about that because you were just talking about that earlier. This really gets to uh, what Sheila was talking about, what Dr. Patel was talking about, uh, about the uh, digestion. There's a concept in Chinese medicine referred to as the digestive fire, and, in, and they call it Agni in Ayurvedic medicine. And it really is talking about the ability of the body to extract the good things from food, the nutritional components, the healing properties, and to expel the, the waste product and to do that smoothly and easily. And when we get sick, that, that, that ability starts to weaken and we end up not fully nourished and not able to easily eliminate and holding on to toxin and waste. And so the, the most foundational thing you can do is to strengthen the Agni. It's to build up the digestive fire and sometimes when people's digestion is very weak, you have to cook your food in a vessel outside of the body, you put the digestive fire into it in essence, pre-digesting it a little bit so that then your weakened power of digestion can be aided by your cooking method. That's also true of, of fermenting and sprouting as well. Those are sort of pre-digested foods are easier to for the body to assimilate, right? Correct. Yeah, a little Correct. bit of breaking the food down, you know, before you ingest it can help then the body so it doesn't have to do as much. And then as that agni that gets stronger, then you may find you can, you know, eat things that you couldn't eat when it was um, not so strong. Although there are some people, again, in Ayurveda that just naturally don't digest raw foods very well. And you know there are these kind of different mind-body types. And, and that might not be so good for them if they try to do that. So it's very interesting. And, I thought um, you raised something very interesting earlier, Anita, when you were talking. 
about one of the things you do at Gerson is, is reduce protein intake. And I know from my own research that Americans, on average, eat about five times more protein than the World Health Organization recommends, and still twice as much as our own USDA recommends, never mind that we also waste 40%. But <laughs> importantly, I, I'm curious about that, because protein is one of those things that, for some people, is harder to digest. So tell me why that's part of what you do at Gerson. Yeah, let me put it in the context first of the fact that the majority of our patients are very seriously ill. And I just want to comment first about food, too, on the Gerson therapy. Uh, cooking methods are a very big part of it, and the food is cooked very slow and low and waterless, and a lot of people experience it as being mushy. But that was that's that purpose of it's not only what you eat, it's what's important, it's what you assimilate, and therefore for a, for a, a body that is stressed and already compromised to have that, like you say, pre-digestion done by that. So the protein is a temporary restriction mm -hmm. during the at least the first six weeks of the therapy because we're trying to uh, mount in that patient some healing reactions and some strong detoxing. So, and then by protein, we mean after six weeks, there could be, for some people, it could be shorter, it could be longer, um, introducing uh, organic low-fat or, uh, or um, yogurt, or some lentils, that type of thing. So it's still That's not- That's an important point. When we say protein, we always tend right. to think of animal products, yeah. but right. there are lots There's, of vegetables that have protein that as right. well. That's <laughs> right. So, yeah. And then also on the, on the therapy, it's a tremendous amount of food. If a person's able to tolerate the full regime, we were talking about this last night, it's 20 pounds a day of fresh organic produce, but about 15 to 16 pounds of that is because there's such an intense juicing regime. And so uh, four carrot juices a day, four carrot apple juices a day, and four green juices. And then the remainder of that is still for three meals. So This is, this is very different when, from you and I, we talked a little bit about official medical food as used in Western medicine and, and what that is versus what she's talking about. Tell us what medical food is, not within your practice, but in general. Well, generally, it's uh, very uh, precise, chemically defined compositions, uh, supplemental foods that are given to people with a very precise um, usually FDA approved definition in mind. But not real food then, powders, supplements, They're almost the, almost the diametric opposite of real food. It's sort of one of those ironies, isn't it, that medical food in the medical pr profession is not food. It's sort of like how vegetables under the farm bill are specialty products. I mean, it's one of these things that sort of boggles the mind. So, um, yeah. And honestly, the, the most healing foods are, are the plants. You know, the other foods, that, and, and it's not that you have to be 100% vegetarian, although, you know, there's a huge amount of data that shows that uh, in, you know, whole food plant-based diet is the healthiest, you know, diet as far as prevention of chronic illness, et cetera. But, you know, so if, if you do have some sort of animal proteins, it should be like a small part of your, you know, diet. And enough, it just, the energy, it's energy food, but all of the healing foods are plant-based. It's nuts, seeds, vegetables, fruits, you know, a lot of the things that people think they have to cut out for reasons that really are just myths, you know, um, and that, that's where the healing foods are. And we need energy foods, of course, which can be from plants as well. But um, it's very interesting, you know, the balance in the typical American diet is swayed way over to now, meat. This seems, I think a lot of people feel sometimes overwhelmed by the information and the sources of information. How do I know what choices to make? What's right for me or my family? And you know, where is there an easy fix or an easy source? You know, where, where does, and anybody, please, where does one go if they say, I want to do the right thing? And we're not talking about diets and short-term restrictions, except maybe in the case of fasting. But you know, how do I know what I, whether I'm eating the things that are good for me or bad for me? Yeah. Well, it, it is so individual. You know, because, for instance, I was directed to the GAPS diet when my sons had severe allergies, but one son was allergic to eggs, the other son was allergic to nuts, and the GAPS diet has a lot of almonds and eggs, and so that just wasn't going to work for us. So I first looked at eliminating <coughs> the processed foods, taking things away, right, the processed foods, the sodas and the chips and all of the processed junk foods, and adding in fermented foods, because that's something I could easily do. And with the fermented foods, I had to give some gold stars for a little bit with my son to get sauerkraut into them. But after a while, it became a habit at dinner, yes. So they are used to now eating um, sauerkraut with dinner almost every day. And one tablespoon of sauerkraut has a trillion good bacteria. 
and, it, and, and that's something, that's a shift for a lot of Americans to think about. We think of bacteria as a negative thing. And we really do need to reintroduce this idea of the bacteria and the microbiome being our friend and, and something that's necessary to take care of. So I like to think of, okay, first, you know, the easy step is to get the junk out of the house. And if, if there's a parent out there that says, well, but my kid will only eat you know, these foods. Well, that's because you're buying them. We are in charge of what we buy. We are in charge of what's in our house. We can put healthy food in our house. We can experiment with, you know, if you, you can make healthy, healthy chicken nuggets, if it's organic, you know, free range pasture aids, all that. Um, and you can also substitute with other types of foods. So I like to start with what's their, the f replacing the f their favorite foods with something that's healthy and adding in the fermented foods to help the gut. Right, and you can also add them in and small doses to a, a meal or a dish yes. they're already used to. and you can sneak to. them in a sandwich. You can, you can do all kinds of things that are fermented. You have like, sneaky tips on your site. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Kefir cheese and, and yogurt, you know, organic yogurt, things like that that they do like, that they will have. You can, you can sneak some good fermented food in there. We, there's an organization locally, Olivewood Garden, and they bring students in to plant and then harvest produce. And then there were a group of volunteer chefs, and I helped on many occasions. And we would teach them, you know, we'd prepare a food using that vegetable. They had just pulled out of the ground, and a lot of the kids, you know, didn't know the vegetables and didn't really want to try it. And I remember one of the chefs, Julie Darling, would always say there was a one bite rule. You had to take one big bite before you were allowed to say no. And I, thought, I always think of that when I try to, you know, usually it's my husband. Uh, I try to ask him to try something that might be green or you know has kale in it. Uh, so you know there's the one bite rule, and then usually if you've done your job well, you know then they'll they'll actually like it, uh, much to their surprise. I, I wanted to ask you something too as a follow up because some of your work has been really focused on gene expression and how that's altered by food, by toxicity, as well as obviously more recently also meditation. But as we're talking about the way food you know affects us, most of us think you know, calorie in, calorie out, fat, carbohydrate, protein. We're talking a little bit about within the family of carbohydrates, there are better and worser, okay? Uh, so, but tell us about, but that's just for this moment, I think. Oh my goodness, should I eat the Cinnabon or the oatmeal? But more specifically, you talk about how, yeah, well, okay, sorry, oh, I failed, dang. Uh, Milbo, you talk about how it's not just affecting you at this moment, but in fact, how genes express themselves, and this creates a trajectory. And t explain that a little bit for people like myself who are not science people. So think about food as being not just those macronutrients, the protein, the carbohydrates, the fats. Think of them as intelligence, as information that influences your physiology. And what we're, so, so food has that energy and uh, you know, protein building is, uh, value to it, but it also has this ability to give your physiology signals, move, its, move the physiology's functioning in a better direction. And that's really what happens with gene expression, is that you're altering things so that, and those gene expression effects the effects on the way that our genes are being expressed can happen in seconds or, and, and then go away in the next few seconds. If you eat that Cinnabon, <laughs> there are enzymes, there are genes in your liver that will be turned on immediately. You will produce enzymes that will allow you to deal with that Cinnabon, okay? For better or for worse. No. And it will have to do with accumulation of um, glycogen and fat and all that sort of stuff. But so it's not just affecting you at that moment, though. Right, right. You're creating a, f a future path, yeah. Right. Be that's the point that comes next, is that when you are eating a certain kind of diet, uh, it affects your functioning, your gene functioning longer term. Has anybody heard the, word, the term epigenetics? Epigenetics. What happens with epigenetics is that when you, when there's a certain impact on your physiology, the effect of that can actually change the way that your genes are chemically functioning. It doesn't change the sequence of the genetic alphabet, but it changes the actual ability of that DNA to be turned on or expressed or not. And this effect can be long-term. In fact, these effects can be inherited. 
so that if there's an epigenetic change that occurs as a result of your diet, that can influence your son or your daughter's diet. And when they continue, it can go on to their children. So these effects can be long-term. And uh, of course, they sort of, uh, you might, if you don't continue the, um, what would you say, the, in the, the stimulus that's giving rise to it, then it falls off in a few generations. But this is something that strongly affects the physiology long-term. And there's now evidence that this occurs with the pesticides that you eat. Anybody heard of atrazine? Atrazine is one of the most commonly used herbicides. It's used in corn, it's used in many crops. There's now research that's been done showing that the effects of atrazine on, this was done in, in mice, if you feed a mouse atrazine in their diet, and then you look at, you will see changes in, in their genome, okay? You look at the, and, and behavioral changes. You look at the next generation, those will be there. And you look at the third generation and they'll be there. So this happens both from the good things in our diet and from the bad things. Well, this is, this is a little heavy and, and you know, Sorry. so, no, no, but it's, it's important because we're looking at pat, our, our history of our own choices in life, our families and, and looking back perhaps. But what's really great about food as medicine is that the choice to change that trajectory can happen as soon as the next meal. Right, so that's a beautiful thing, and so that's what, what you really focus on, right? How, and you as well, like how to flip from and avoid some of the toxins, both in the food, on the food, or in the environment generally, and, and or how to counteract that by limiting those toxins and choosing, choosing food for health. And there's studies that show that within one week, 90% of the pesticides were reduced in a family in Sweden that went organic, and, and within two weeks, 100% were out of their system and out of their body. So it, is, it can be done very quickly. Now, that's, that's very encouraging, I think. Yes. That's the beauty of it. Maybe you don't know exactly which foods are right for your dosha, for you know, your body type, and you might want to do some research online or go see a professional. But what you do know is if you can avoid the bad and shoot for the good, then you're in the right direction. The, what you were just describing describing Zen, what that says to me is that we have a profound ability to change our health and that probably the most singularly most important thing is not even worrying so much about pesticides or contaminants, but just simply choosing healthy food because it will be restorative, not quite overnight, but almost so. Within a week, two weeks, we see changes in the pattern of the gut microbiome in a matter of days. And we can influence this. They did eat organic, though. They were purposely avoiding pesticides. That sure. Family. Yes. Sure. Oh, I'm not advocating that people continue eating even plant foods that are contaminated. Okay, great. Um, but I mean, but the thing is that just simply stopping that and replacing it with healing foods that help to bind and take toxins out of the body and replace them with really good things can have a profound, almost overnight effect. And with regard to the gut microbiome, we talk a lot about the fermented foods, and I'm a big fan of them, but the singularly most important thing we can do, again, is a whole food plant-based diet that provides the fiber and the resistant starch that nourishes the microbes that are already there. It feeds the good guys, and it, and it doesn't feed, it actually sort of starves, although I don't want to use the negative term, but it doesn't feed the opportunistic ones that overgrow and cause so many problems. So just simply, the singularly most important thing is change your diet in this healthy way, and the effects are profound. That certainly was your experience. When it was, this made me think as we're talking here, this is your life, this is what you did and what happened to you. It's, you know, it's interesting because not, I think a lot of us um, wanna eat healthy. We hear all these things, we hear GMO, non-GMO, um, we hear organic better than organic. Um, if you're in the farming community, some people tell you that organic has lost its real meaning. All these different kind of labels that get slapped on everything. We heard them all before we started doing this. Um, we, we shopped organically. Uh, when you're in Guantanamo Bay, you shop with whatever is there. Um, so it's a little different, but, but when we even started the growing- The farmer's we, market. Yeah, yeah, we, we, even, we just got our seeds from the local seed store. I mean, nothing, didn't really pay attention to how they were grown and where they came from and whether or not they were manually hybridized or any of that. And we were growing. And I was having responses to corn 
which I'm a California kid. I mean, we three world tacos are like a part of every college here. Um, and I was having this like severe reaction to corn. I would I would have uh, a mini seizure. My my face would tick. I would and and we're talking very quickly. Um, and then the next handful of days, all my joints would be um, really sore. I'd have trouble walking again. And it took us a while to, to figure it out. And finally, I did a, just a sensitivity test, not necessarily an allergy test. And it was showing up as like number one, then those and corn and plums. And my thought process was, you can't not eat corn in the United States. It's in everything. It's in your medicine. It's in makeup. It's, it's literally everywhere. And we, we tried it, and we were getting the medicine I had to take compounded, and it wasn't making a difference. And for me, th when we talk about making these changes, there's, there's kind of the, um, there's the perfect world, right? And then there's also the, I'm already overwhelmed, mm -hmm. I have a diagnosis, I'm just trying to keep my life in order, I just need to know what I have to do today to make sure I get to tomorrow, and then I'll figure out tomorrow, right? And for me, that w corn was the thing that I was like, this is absurd. I don't know how this is, I'm gonna do this the rest of my life and not, and really just live, right? Um, so I took some time and I read a lot about heirloom and heirloom varieties and how that people were, that were having sensitivities to even uh, wheats, that they were able to eat heirloom varieties and not have a reaction. Um, so I convinced my husband to listen to me. Um, and we planted a small patch of heirloom corn. And uh, when we were harvesting it, my dad and I were standing there and, and we peeled it. And Mike stopped me when I met him. He was a paramedic. And he's like, my, here, my job here is to save you. Like, that's my job, right? I wear a cape. My job is to save you. If you have a reaction, I don't ever want to hear corn again. Like, suck it up. Like, we're done. And dad and I sat there and pulled it off and we're eating sweet corn just standing there and no reaction. And literally, within the next two weeks, we pulled everything out and we converted 100% to heirloom. Because it took it from, I'm not a scientist, I don't have that background, it took it from all this stuff that we hear, and this group says this, and this group says that, and, and it took it from this anecdotal, I don't know who to believe, everybody's arguing, to the like, I can tell you, if I eat this, my body literally physically reacts in a way people can see, and it's negative, and if I eat this, it doesn't. And that's that change that even with organic, it's one step further. And, and the hard part with organic is for a lot of years, all of the genetic testing for GMO was too expensive for these agencies to even be doing it. So you have grains that people are saying they're organic, but depending on when, when you kind of made that transition, California Organic Cert, I've spoke to them just this past year and they said the tests are cheap. They test every time grain comes into California because that happens to be a big thing that's genetically modified, um, that they're actually testing it. But the problem is, is that if you're, if you're eating a varietal that is either uh, manually hybridized and you're allergic to one part of that, pluots is a good example. I'm allergic to plums, so I can't have pluots. Um, I also have some trouble with some of the tree nuts and because that's all in that family. So if it's hybridized with something to give it a better shelf life or to give it a different flavor and you don't know that, you're going to have a reaction. So for me, going completely organic or completely um, heirloom was the change that made the huge difference. And, and trust me, like as any normal, we have people that say like, oh, and let me guess, Amazon's never at your house and like you don't use toilet paper, you use cloth and all, just all this crazy <laughs> stuff, right? And I was like, no, Amazon's on my house every day. It's the cheapest way to run a farm. And, and I still eat food that's not heirloom, right? Like uh, that's life. But I can tell you, I can walk and I'm not twitching and I'm not lifting my legs at the end of the day when I eat the way that I know my body needs me to eat. This is, this is some, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, I was just gonna say, you bring up a really interesting point that also that we're always trying to get people to, you know, you can give people guidelines yeah. because we have some information about, you know, general principles, but it's about listening to your body. You know, and if you eat something, even if your sister or your whoever spouse says, you know, this is really good and you should eat it, and your body says, no, you know, and if we're listening, we, you know, it, it'll tell us, then that's not right for you. And then you try something else and you say, oh my gosh, I feel amazing when I eat this. 
and then you know that too. And you have to be honest with yourself because our minds can trick us and say, you know, but well, you're eating our Cinnabon so every day, say, feeling I, great, but. Yeah, right. <laughs> the Girl Scout cookie message is incorrect. Okay, got it. Yeah, so, and I do, I, I tell people, clear. follow an 80-20 rule, you know, because also we add a lot of stress by saying, I have to 100% of the time eat this perfect food. And, right. you know, our body's pretty resilient when we're, you know, out of that really, really sick stage. Yeah that we can, you know, sometimes have that food, but, you know, most of your diet should be like what your body is healthiest with. The important thing though is to not give up, that she, right. she pursued it and right. she went after the heirloom corn. You could have just said, that's it, no corn yeah. ever again. Yeah. Like we did with my son, it was no nuts, you know, once he almost died from nuts, we said no nuts, not ever again. And, and I, we were just resigned and doubtful that anything could change until one day he said, mom, I wish all my allergies would go away. Mm. And I said, me too, buddy. But in my head, I was saying, that's never gonna happen. And then I realized, wait a second, that's not empowering, that's not what I'm committed to. What if something could be different? What if there is some other Ayurveda, you know, or some other way to, to, to have an opportunity happen and something could happen? So I asked him, would you like to, you know, maybe one day eat a slice of pizza at a birthday party, which he couldn't do at that time, um, because we knew a cousin who had gone gluten-free and eventually she could have it, right? Once she healed her gut, she could have it later on. And he said, yes. And I said, well then would you be my partner? Would you partner me with me in your health? Would you drink green drinks and try alternative medicines and all that? He said, yes. And I said, then I promise you, you're going to get better. And that promise, whether you do that for yourself or your spouse or your child is very important because then that has you do things you normally would never do, right? Like when you go to a doctor and you, you make that promise to follow that protocol, you step up and you do things that you normally never would do. So the important thing is to not give up and to keep trying new things and to, to promise somebody else that you're gonna do this. Well, and the easy answer is not always, you know, what we tend to do is say, I can't eat wheat or I can't eat avocados, but let's remember like, what kind is being grown and is it a very hybridized, modernized version or is it a heritage, heritage or heirloom variety? Sometimes they call them biblical, right? Uh, on the other hand, and then therefore, how is it grown? Is it grown organically? Is it grown conventionally and or GMO, which means that it's likely to carry a significantly higher toxic load? And of course, then again, on top of that, it depends on which kind of you know, vegetable you're talking about. I don't know if you guys are familiar, but Environmental Working Group puts out something called the Dirty Dozen and they say, Look, not everybody's perfect. None of us buys 100% organic all the time, or most of us don't. And so there are certain foods that are more likely to carry a toxic load, and these are the ones they say, buy organic. These other ones, they might still have it, but they don't carry quite the toxic load. So again, it's not sort of a one-size-fits-all on these things. I had a reaction to an allergic-type reaction, white blood cell buildup, and so my body constantly felt tired and sick because it thought it was you know, fighting these foreign invaders. And once you go through a process to eliminate and clean and detoxify, then your body is just sort of focused on itself again and can move forward instead of constantly in fight mode. It, how does, is that consistent with what you, you experience in your work? I, I wanted to just pick up on Zen bringing up empowerment because we know from the research that when people are engaged in their own health care, mm -hmm. even things like monitoring your blood pressure or your glucose or, so what's any more involvement than your daily preparation of, of food? And also, I've always heard that if you're trying to make changes in your life, a lot of people kind of go to all or nothing instead of realizing that if you'll make some small steps, that can make some big differences. If you just go home and get rid of one or two things in your home that, that you feel is the most destructive or that you don't feel good about. The other thing, too, is to have a plan. Uh, and on Gerson, do we ever have a plan? We, we, we tell people exactly every hour <laughs> what you're doing and what juice and what kind of, what, what meal and what things need to be involved in that meal and then what you're going to do the next day and that kind of thing. But, but the same thing applies to, to us in our day-to-day -day lives, too. Um, nothing's any more empowering than to, to literally, quote, excuse the, excuse the pun, step up to the plate and, and uh, take care, you know, take charge, take charge. But for your, some people, it is 100%, at least for a while. 
just make that sure. commitment to go 100%. You know, for instance, like gluten, getting gluten or dairy out of your diet, it takes months for that to come out of your body. So it is important to go 100% as much as, you know, as and much as you up. possibly can. And don't give up. Yeah, and, and I do want to add that my son did get better. His allergies went from a 19 down to a 0.2. And so he no longer has life-threatening allergies to nuts, which typically get worse, not better. And he did that by healing him, himself. Yeah. Well, and I think one of the disservices we do in like really conventional medicine is is disempower people, you know. And and I think the worst thing you can tell a patient is this is what's going to happen, you know. And I like as an integrative provider, and you know, I do primary care still. Uh, you know, I send people to specialists, and you know, if they need certain tests, and then they'll come back and tell me, oh, the GI doctor, they, they said diet has nothing to do with this, and it's like, oh my god, the gosh, GI doctor know. who focuses on <laughs> digestion, the cancer ward that serves donuts, yeah. and can yes, and and you know, and they'll say the the. Um, <laughs> rheumatologist or the whoever said that this is what's going to happen with this disease and so I need to do this medicine or whatever and you know and not to d you know I, I'm kind of on both sides in the sense that I, I do see what happens when people don't do anything and yes that is true that would happen if you do nothing however if you do these things like change your diet and um, then then you can shift that trajectory and it doesn't have to look like that and just giving people that that sense that our body is constantly changing and that every choice we make affects that change. It's a dynamic process. It's not necessarily just you're headed down this course. That may be true if you don't change what you're doing because that's kind of what how you got here. And so I think just giving people that little sense of you know empowerment and a different perspective that this is really a dynamic process going on right now. Like we were talking about, the microbiome can shift in a couple of days. Um, one bite of food you take can shift your gene expression. And then you start to realize like, wow, I can really affect what's happening. I think that Super sometimes powerful. that empowerment is also daunting because then it means that I have a responsibility as well. And you know, I think these things are sometimes in, in turmoil. Obviously, no one here is saying that you know, anything and everything can be 100% cured with diet. On the other hand, can you alter the trajectory that one says that you are on dramatically? I think the answer is clearly yes. You look like you want to jump in. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's really a, a continuum of possibilities. There are some things where diet, some diseases where diet probably will have a marginal, if little, effect. It might help your health in other ways, but not necessarily address the disease. On the other hand, there are some diseases on the other end that are diet-driven, and some of the most common and important ones are very much on that it end of the on continuum. It's the top two or three, right? Yes. So um, th you were asking before about the uh, concept that I was going to mention about the therapeutic order. Oh, sure, your pyramid. Yes, okay. and yeah. this is... No, no, this is good because most of us are used to the sort of Western paradigm, which is, you know, what drug do I get or what procedure do I need? Let me keep eating my honey bun or Cinnabon. <laughs> uh, but no, <laughs> so, so how is your, yours is very different. You're very different. Well, years ago when I studied some of the more ancient healing systems, Chinese medicine, Ayurvedic, it was intuitive to me that you started with food, food and lifestyle, and you change, you create the conditions for health with these, and then only when those aren't sufficient do you then go up sort of the, the ladder or the, uh, the pyramid toward increasingly invasive kinds of things. If you're in a car accident, you go straight to a, the trauma center. You don't waste your time with you know, diet and herbs and all that. But <laughs> Write that down, folks. <laughs> if you're unconscious, that's not the time to do psychotherapy. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, actually, a calming influence is always a good thing. And healthy food, when a person recovers, is the first thing after the crisis has been resolved. So we have to use really good judgment. But in naturopathic medicine, they came up with this concept called the therapeutic order. And it really holds that diet and lifestyle is the foundation. Most things, before we ever even medicalize them and give them a label and scare people with all this workup and evaluation, they'll simply resolve if we change the health conditions through diet and lifestyle. And then if that's not sufficient, we use targeted natural therapeutics, herbs, acupuncture, uh, allopathic medicine when that's not sufficient. And then of course- What's allopathic medicine? Allopathic is Western medicine, the way the common you know, understanding of uh, you know, disease uh, or symptom focused and 
you know, pharmaceutically or surgically based interventions at the forefront. Well, I, I think this is really important. You know, we've been talking a lot about how we might use food to deal with a particular problem. But again, if we go back to sort of body fundamentals and immune system and gut as the origin of the good or the bad, you know, maybe what we're doing is we're creating a lean, mean fighting machine so that when the incoming comes, we're better able to ward it off. Is that true? It sounds really good, Star Wars-y like, but I like it. Is that, I mean, that, that's that's so, right? Absolutely. You know, children children used to play outside barefooted on the earth. They weren't slathered with the antibacterial soap. Um, as a kid, I ate dirt. I tasted everything on the farm. You know, my mother would wait. She'd see me coming down the lane, and she'd wait with a garden hose to hose me down <laughs> so that I could go in the house because I would step on anything. I tried to drink water out of the dog's bowl. You know, those <laughs> those kinds of exposure to, to just those ba what we're talking about, you know. So, and as we know now, it's as in the soil, so in the gut. And um, so she was very wise in a lot of ways to, to have given me that freedom. So your immune system is stronger because I am, of that. I have a very sturdy immune yes. system. Yes, yeah. Charlotte, Charlotte Gerson tells me that if she had done to her body what I did, that she'd been gone a long time ago, and she's 96 years old, but she's, she's lived very clean, eaten very clean. And, and if there is a crisis, by, by living this way, we've created resilience within ourselves that will help us enormously during that crisis. That's what I wanted to hear a little bit more about, because I think that's, you know, we're not just talking about, again, you know, if we think about disease or, or, or symptom focus, now we're backtracking to young, healthy people. How do we keep them that way and strong? I mean, and, and how does it do that, and why does that matter? Well, we really need to start with how we educate our children. You know, start with what we are feeding our kids. Maybe that's the most singularly most important thing or place to focus if we want to build a healthy uh, population, healthy society. So they have healthy habits of their own. And and so that for them, it's they know what a vegetable is, they know where it grows, and into it. Then that helps them develop their intuition about how to heal themselves or what they need to do. And I think that ties in just lifestyle in general. Like, are you taking your kids outside, or are they inside all the time, or you know? And then, are, is it just, is there just overstimulation and stress? Like, is a huge factor with digestion, you know, and how you digest your food really and your immune down, system and everything. So, when you know, because we teach meditation and, and lifestyle in addition to food, like food is a big component. And again, when you're doing all of these things and you're reducing the stress response and you're connecting to nature and all of these things and teaching your kids how to do that, then, you know, again, sometimes things do happen and, and we do need medications for things and certain people. And But your, your body is going to be able to use anything you give it in a much better way when the foundations are there. You know. it's, it's important to trust your children, too, that they can do much more than a lot of us think that they can do. For instance, um, my middle son had autism symptoms when he was about eight and a half, a sudden onset of autism symptoms, hitting and yelling and grades dropped you know, from A's down to D's. And it was not like him. And so I took him to the doctor and he tested him for fungus and bacteria in his urine. I said, why are you testing for fungus and bacteria? He said, because oftentimes the bad gut bacteria can lead to inflammation in the brain, which can lead to behavioral issues. And I thought, wow, that's what glyphosate does. You know, that's what's in Roundup that's sprayed in our food. And it occurred to me that that son was eating wheat, which is sprayed with glyphosate or Roundup as a drying agent. It does not wash off. And not it even not, GMO, just conventional. Yeah, it's not GMO. It's just, it's so, so wheat, uh, wheat uh, legumes, beans, peas, tea, oats. sugar, oats are highly sprayed with glyphosate as a drying agent if it's not organic. And so he was eating this, you know, gluten food because my other two sons were gluten intolerant, but he was not. So he was the only one that was eating gluten. And at that time we tested, again, very important, we tested his urine and his urine was eight times higher of glyphosate levels than was ever found in Europe. And so there was Roundup in my son and uh, we realized that we needed to go strictly organic and he needed to not eat sugar. And this was between Thanksgiving and New Year's. <laughs> 
and he promised to do that, and he did that, and we uh, went strictly organic, 100%, even like the canned chicken, we had to get that out because that's not organic. And, um, and we did put in uh, probiotics and colloidal silver. We did have to do a, a compound antifungal medicine, but that was $650 a month. So when people tell me they can't afford organic, I remind them the cost of medicine. <laughs> it is much more expensive. And then within six weeks, we retested him for glyphosate. His levels were no longer detectable and his autism symptoms were gone and have never come back. But he did that also by not eating sugar. He made that choice. And we trusted, you know, that he would do that in partnership with him. And so I think we need to trust our children and our family members, even even like if you have a mom or a dad that you're like, oh, they're never going to change their diet. Don't do that to them. <laughs> Give Show them the movies like GMO, OMG, or Genetic Roulette, or there's a great movie out now called Modified. There's a new movie called Secret Ingredients. It's all about people healing through food. There's a movie that's coming out pretty soon called Food Cure, right? So there's great educational tools that you can use out there. Just have faith that they will be inspired by one of them. And, I'm glad and try that it. you mentioned some of the, the desiccation and the use of glyphosate in that process, because I think a lot of people assume that Roundup is only associated with GMO crops and not conventional crops that aren't, you know, haven't been modified to withstand the spraying. But all of these grain crops get sprayed at the end for desiccation. And interestingly, if you're not aware, you can look at Food Democracy Now did some testing of basic breakfast cereals. And one of the things that for me was most horrific was to see that out of all of the cereals they tested, the one that had the single highest residual rate of glyphosate was ordinary Cheerios. And I think to myself, what is the one food that every parent in America carries around in a small you know, Ziploc or Tupperware to feed to their child? It's Cheerios, and that has a really high toxic load. And so there are some foods, and that, that's one of them that you, know, you really may want to pay attention to eating organic if you want to reduce that toxic load and how it might affect you. And it's, it's very important also that vegan and vegetarians understand that hummus and uh, chickpeas, garbanzo beans, had the highest levels along with wheat. So if you're feeding your child a, a plate of chickpeas and hummus and they have oatmeal for breakfast and then they have buckwheat noodles for dinner, they are eating the highest levels of glyphosate exposure that you can possibly expose them to. So unless you buy organic. Unless you buy organic. So it's very important to not just be vegan and vegetarian if that's what you're doing, but to also purchase organic food to, in order to avoid glyphosate. I think it's also important to not put the focus just on glyphosate. I'm not saying it's a healthy thing at all, but the same kinds of dietary changes that will reduce glyphosate also change the food in many other ways. When you're, you, when you're eating refined products, they have a thousand things, including glyphosate perhaps, but also many other negative attributes. And so we can't just pin it on the glyphosate and say, that's that's the evil thing, because we're like the seven blind men with the elephant and saying it's just the trunk or it's just the tail. We really need to think about, and not even, not even focusing on villainizing things, but on focusing in a positive way on what we want, what we want to move toward. And I come back again, like a broken record, to a whole food plant-based diet, not a refined diet, but one that is that has intact kernel whole grains, not villainizing them because, oh, they may contain gluten or they may contain you know, glyphosate or whatever, but because they are rich in healing properties that nourish the microbiome from underneath, create that balance, create good gut-brain connections, activate genes in the brain, Ta change the expression in the brain that code for neurotransmitters that make us happy, reduce our stress, reduce our anxiety. So changing the dietary pattern in this way, I think is really that, I want people to focus in a positive way on what they can do to help themselves and Stay not just what- Stay on the edges of the grocery store. <laughs> yes. Can I yes. just touch on- Can I just touch I, on- I, I, I agree with you, that's really it's the foundation but in this day and age, we need to look to these indicators for, of impurity in our food. And uh, we look at glyphosate as being an indicator of other things. In, uh, in meat products, there are also indicators, a few things that you can measure easily that are, are indicators that you don't want to eat that chicken. You want to eat another one. And it's critical that people be given the ability to make those choices. And Zen talks about glyphosate because that's been an indicator that's made a big deal, big difference for her family. 
But we need to go deeper than that. And we need, in, in a way, what we're finding in our work, because we've tested hundreds of products at this point, and what we find is that uh, the difference between conventional and organic is striking. And so by making the choice of going organic or growing your own, and especially even going to the, uh, you know, the ancient varieties, uh, this making that choice, however you can personally make it, has a huge effect. And so we can then, from that foundation, begin to make good choices about what we eat in there. It's very important to, to avoid these things. I hear and I agree with what you're saying, John. My concern is that if we focus just on the negative thing, like, you know, ooh, stay away from that in a kind of phobic way, and we don't put equal or greater emphasis on moving toward healing foods and thinking about the richness and focusing on the diversity of taste and the balance of the foods and understanding how the, the healing properties within us, we're, we're going to compromise our ability for self-healing. So yes, you definitely want to understand the toxic load of foods and and I'm not advocating them in the least. If anything, I would, that's one of the first things I warn people against. But, but, I, but I think the emphasis needs to be a positive one, an affirming one toward life and foods that are rich in life energy. This is always an eat this, not that kind of dialogue. And you know, it, this is a bit of a yin and yang kind of conversation. But of course, we're talking about all the things that you, could, you should eat and, and what they do to the body and how they can uh, create a stronger immune system and how they can deal with even specific ailments and so on. You can get down into the weeds, like here's a food that's good for the brain or the liver or in, has great numbers of lysine. Great. Uh, or you can sort of focus on, um, you know, my pollen, eat food, mostly greens, not so much. I mean, sometimes, like, I always sort of come back to that again and say, you know, that, that's sort of the fundamentals. On the one hand, you don't want to get, you, these are important issues, extremely important issues, but you also don't want to become, you know, fearful of food. I had someone come over the other day and said, I don't want to eat your romaine lettuce out of your garden. I hear it has E. coli. And I said, well, not this one, I think, I hope, but I mean, but, that, but, 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 but that's, that's an important point because, you know, we can, we, can, we can all focus and agree on, you know, eat real food, not processed food. Okay, step one. And then we can talk about, you know, whole nutritionally dense foods. Great, we all agree. Now, as, as we get down and we say, okay, so then we have organic, conventional, GMO, we probably all agree on which of those is the best as well. But I think, you know, it is sometimes good to stay here. We don't want to make people fearful of, you know, romaine <laughs> lettuce, I think about that. But then there is a study, there was a study out recently that showed that women who were doing IVF to get pregnant, that were eating fruits and veggies, the ones who ate the fruits and veggies with pesticides on it had lower levels of success. So it's not factual to just say, eat your fruits and veggies. If you really want to be healthy and to, to get pregnant and to have healthy children, it does need to be organic fruits and veggies for the best outcome. Well, actually, Zen, Ideally. I would totally turn that around and I would put veggies way before fruit and I would put whole grains and veggies at the top because people have a misconception about what is even healthy within a plant-based diet. You know, fruits are important, especially when, when it's the right season for them, but we want to we wanna have greater diversity and when we're encouraging people to have uh, clean versions of these and, and life energy filled versions of these, you know, we don't, I think, I also wonder when you mention uh, people who, you know, women who are go undergoing IVF and didn't have as good a result, it may have been a function of what was in the fruits and veggies they were eating, or maybe they were missing other things in their diet that were healing. It may have also been that their awareness of that was a reflection of other, or lack of awareness of, of that, was a reflection of other things. Were they more likely to be smoking, to be you know, drinking alcohol, to not exercise? So I think we have to be careful to say, oh, it was their non-organic fruits and veggies that was the cause when it was part of a larger pattern. Well, but when we know that there's pesticides that cause endocrine disruption and impact you know, fertility, of course. We, we know that now, So with, especially with glyphosate. Yeah. So it is, it's, it's just not factual, I'm just saying, to, to tell people to eat whole fruits and vegetables without addressing the issue of pesticides that can, I mean, we have a thousand endocrine disruptors 
in the United States. Sweden allows three. These endocrine disruptors impact fertility, sterility. We have, you know, a sperm quality level of men now is 50% of what their grandfathers were. We have an issue in the United States, and it is, it is primarily stemming from, I believe, and many doctors believe now, the toxic burden. And that toxic burden is prim primarily introduced through our population through the food and the water. And that's coming from GMO chemical farming. And other, and other sources. I mean, there's others that, too, but look, that's look, a primary. The point one. is, I think the, the point that he's making, and you guys actually are agreeing, but it's just that <laughs> as a legal matter, you can't point to a single cause in most instances because any our toxic load comes from a variety of sources. Those are two big ones. Uh, but there are others, you know, and it's one of the reasons why in the law it's often hard to prove these kinds and of cases. And as a scientific and as a scientific a matter. As an epidemiologist, I know that we have to be careful when we assert this is the cause, that's the effect, when there are multiple potential causes that are associated with one another that go together, and so we really don't know. I'm not at all arguing for GMOs or for toxins in food, quite the contrary, but, but to say that's the cause, that's the effect, I get a little concerned, and I think we may we may weaken our, our argument or the force of what we're arguing for because people can find you know, the, the potential flaw in the reasoning and then dismiss everything else we're saying. So I want us to be really strong in our arguments and really grounded. I and, and that's can I put the, out a unifying concept that we should be going for nutrient dense foods that are toxin uh, lacking the toxins that you put lowest toxic load together yeah. Yeah. and then you're in good shape yeah. and if you look at and the, the the key thing it's easy to say yes foods that are infused with nutrients and uh, we want all of that but for the mom or the dad it's well where do I get those how do I tell if this zucchini is better than that zucchini you know, if and no 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 let me finish um, the the key thing there is that we do have some indicators we there is quite a lot of research out there indicating that organic is more nutrient dense than conventional and also that organic is lower in these toxins than than conventional and so it's pretty illogical to use that as a big guide. It's not enough. It really isn't. And this is what you experience. Well, I, I just wait. Mm -hmm. I just but want to go back to what good, I said a minute ago a about the Environmental start. Working Group study and what they have on their website, which is, look, I think we have to be honest. I think in a perfect world, we're eating organic 100% of the time, and some people are. But not everyone is, and maybe not everyone has access to that. So for the majority of people, it's certainly in some areas, let's talk about those things which we should most avoid, and that includes foods, certain foods over other certain foods, but most importantly, it's processed foods. So let's go back to whole foods and talk about how whole foods, nutrient dense, is the way to sort of create this. I want to add another attribute, though, and that's what's in season, what's growing in our own backyard, because if we, if we understand that we're eating with the seasons, because if we eat locally, we're going to be doing that more or less, and we understand that plants have life energy and intelligence, we also understand that that changes over the course of time, over the course of a year. The life energy of plants, where is it in the winter? It's down in the roots. The leaves have come off. The sap has gone down. The life energy is the chi of the plant, and the, the, and, and the nutrients follow that. So if we in the winter are eating the more rooty kinds of things, the more the stored nuts and grains, and we cook them with fire to make them more digestible, and in the summer we're eating more leafy things and fruits at the right time, we're going to be naturally going where the nutrients are the most dense. And so I think Ayurveda it's a, really focuses on seasonal eating as well. What you eat in the summer versus the cold or the hot weather is very absolutely. Different. It can get very, very. Um, sophisticated in the in like even what the phases of the moon where when you harvest the fruits and things like that and it's I, I that sounds like biodynamic now yeah yeah I mean I and I fully I believe it um, and and you know again just to speak to the whole conversation like the thing I love about Ayurveda is that there's you are, you're always going back to the basic principles and the basic principles you know and like when we we do do detoxes and cleanses because we you know even despite our best efforts we are exposed we live in a world that in Ayurveda the 
whatever's out there is in us as well. Like you were saying, your son, you know, he, we all have these chemicals in us. We, and there have been studies where we could draw the blood of everyone in the room and you're exposed to things you didn't even know were in you because anything that's happening out there is our body. In Ayurveda, that is our extended body. And, and when, when you start talking about that, you, I think it brings a little bit of social consciousness and social awareness to supporting organic and supporting um, you know, how we're treating the environment, um, maybe not necessarily for a selfish purpose, but kind of in a way, because that is our body. And so that's going to affect us. So you know, when we're cleansing, we say we're doing two things. We're, we're taking out what isn't serving the body, and we're pr bringing in what it needs to heal. And so like, those are two really basic principles. And that's, again, speaking to all of this, is, is we want to remove what's, what's not serving us and what's creating disease and blocking our natural pathways. And we want to bring in nutrient-rich food that's, that's natural. So we always go back to nature. So again, whether it's the cycles and the seasons, or whether it's producing food as naturally as you can, meaning not putting man-made things on there, um, you know, these are like the core principles. And you know, like if you can just have that in your awareness and just be aware every time you're choosing food, you know, chances are you're going to be much more on that side of making the best choices for your health. You know. I just, I think as a, as a culture, we tend to be in, San Diego is great. We have a lot of farms here. Um, you can- the More you can go, farms per capita yes. than anyone, in, anywhere in America, folks. You can go to a farmer's market. I think every day of the week, except Monday, is how, is last time I read it. I think Monday is the, or the one that has the There's least- There's even a farmer's market here on campus, right. just down that grassy area. So we have that, but we're also culturally really disconnected from our food, right? We don't know our farmer. We think local means, California. So if I'm going to get carrots from Central California and that's local, but I can't get grapes from Baja because that's out of country and that's not local, we're disconnected. We're missing something major. Um, when I have people ask me when, when we have figs ready and they say, how many days do I have to wait to eat these? And the first time I was asked, I was like, what are you talking about? You eat them whenever you want. And the answer was no, I always get them and they're hard and I have to wait till they get soft. And I'm like, oh, by the way, figs don't ripen off the tree. They're going rotten, eat them. Like we, we're, right? We're disconnected from that. It looks similar. So, yeah, yeah, texture is kind of different, but, but we're disconnected from that part of it. And, and then there's also some, some information that's been out there that says like um, millennial generation is the, the generation that has it's something like less than 30% actually know how to cook and there, and there's no desire to so it's not like they're refusing it's just that there's no desire to it's a different it's a different kind of generation and they're not doing that all of those things mean that we that like it or not we're falling on processed foods in some fashion they may be they may be better processed foods because they're organic but that part of it, if, if all people could do, and we have, I, I still go to treatment every day. I'm back in treatment. I was in uh, remission for 18 months. I started back in treatment actually the day Christina and I launched pharmacy, which just was the most ironic thing in the world, but I was there. So I, I sit and get significantly less uh, medicines than I did the first time around, actually very, very little. But that means every day since we launched it, I'm talking to the other patients and talking to people in a real world life scenario, right? How we all eat and how we wanna eat is probably like the best of the best. And then there's like life. And their answer is, I don't know how to cook that. I don't know how to break down um, garlic. I don't know how to make yogurt. I don't know how to do all of these things. So if I could make that one change, right? So if I could get rid of the 12 items that I should never buy conventional and only buy organic, what are those? And so I agree with that. I agree that there's like these baby steps that have to get there. And then you realize things like um, you eat a tomato that's from your local farmer and that's the best tomato that you'll ever have. The ugly one that's got appendages, you know. Right, and right. And those are, and to me, those are the, um, like instant gratification, right? Like, so, you, so you, you have somebody that goes, well, I get this and I'm used to getting that, or I always just get whatever yogurt and it says organic and it's okay. And then they start to kind of go more to those whole foods and they're like, oh, I can actually make yogurt or 
I can make my own pasta sauce and get closer towards that. I think, I think part of what's needed here is to draw on both sides of the brain. The scientific reductionist side is very important for, you know, for making sure we're doing things carefully, but we also want to unleash the artist our intuition, we want to get in tune with the natural rhythms of nature because that's telling us where the nutrients are. The two, there, it's not one juxtaposed against the other. It helps us to understand and to deepen our healing. Well, um, we're about out of time and I just sort of want to close with a final thought. It's something my husband often says, you know, there's a lot of information that's been imparted today from the sort of 30,000 view perspective and down into the weeds on the positive and on the potential negatives. Um, and, and I guess he likes to say that you should never let the perfect perfect be the enemy of the good enough. And we all have to, to make the steps and take the steps that we're ready and able to make at this point in our life and hopefully heading toward perfection and on a right trajectory. Uh, but we all do the best we can. Listen, keep this conversation alive. We will continue to engage. We'll bring in the panelists, just hashtag food is medicine on Twitter um, and or Facebook. And we'll, we want to keep this going because I think this is fundamentally um, the, the, the most fundamental building block of our own health. And as it turns out, the health of our communities and the environment. Thank you for coming. Bye-bye, folks on Facebook. <laughs>